Hello, everybody. Namaskaram. I hope you can hear me clearly. And, uh, and if you can, please do show me a thumbs up digitally or on video if you are. Okay, great. That's awesome. Um, I'm at this place called Himachal, close to the mountains, a little bit of rural space. And it is surprisingly cloudy and expecting thunderstorms. So a couple of things as we're starting, I just wanted to share is that uh, I'm using a couple of devices to make sure that if one breaks, the other one runs. And in case there's a network issue, um, I have prepared some slides so you won't be staring at an empty screen and my voice, I can just join in an audio and share. So I hope that's okay. Um, and I will be primarily sharing in English today. Um, and I understand we all have different comforts in terms of languages and preferences. So at any point, if you feel that I'm speaking too fast or if I'm pronouncing words in a way that are not very clear, please feel free to raise your digital hands or just uh, let me know. Uh, and if you are engaging with me in any way uh, using the chat option, please check to see that uh, you're sending the message to uh, Unlearning Ashram PC. Right. So there's, there, there's, that's my, that's the one in which I can check the chats. The other one is my phone. I won't be able to check that. Okay. With that, uh, let's get started. Welcome to the art of unlearning. Um, I feel when we start with something like the art of unlearning, I know it's a, it's a word that's often used. And before we start, um, I thought I'll share the first slide because I feel what I've been wanting to do today with all of us is that uh, I've been wanting to see if we can come together and really look at the time that we are spending uh, in the next couple of hours, uh, just to see if we can really get intense about exploring and diving deep into what is unlearning and for us, and what does that really mean in the context of ourselves and in the world? So let me just share something. I thought, uh, for me, it's a very serious topic uh, at times. So the question that I was sitting with was, um, I've always been very serious about playing whenever I get into any kind of sport or games. Uh, but today, I was wondering if I can invite all of us to see if we can be a little playful about being serious about learning and learning and exploring and learning today. And what this means, for me at least, is that playfulness is about creativity. Playfulness is about staying open to multiplicities of truths and to keep challenging our conclusions and our, uh, you know, whatever known that we are sitting with. So today, uh, as we begin, I thought we'll do something a little bit interactive, uh, starting off with a little bit of creativity from my end. I thought this would be fun since I ha anyway had to do uh, a, a few slides. Um, so I thought I'd just start off by giving the handles to uh, people who are exploring unlearning with me today. So I leave it up to you. I would love to know your choice. We can, we'll be starting with a story but I would like to offer you the choice of, would you like to hear a story from my uh, journey of unlearning? And uh, there's a very interesting stories of, with uh, the wisdom of monkeys. Uh, that's really fun, which is also another way we could start. Or we could start with humanity story of unlearning altogether. But if you notice in my urgent design that I've made, the roots uh, are also sort of interconnected. So, Whichever direction we start with, we are going to end up touching all of them anyway, right? So what I'd like to hear from you in the time that we have, maybe in the chat option, uh, you can just either say A, B, or C from left to right. A for the story of my story of unlearning, B for the wisdom story with the monkeys, and C for humanity's story of unlearning. Whatever is your choice, we'll see with what people want, and then we'll go with that. All right. Oh, A, B, and C. Of course, we're going to get to all of them. <laughs> all right. Okay. A, B, C agreed. Let's start with A. All right. 
A, A, all, of course, we're going to do all of it. Uh, we're just looking at which doorway do we start with and then enter the, the connected routes of all of these narratives that we'll anyway be, anyway be exploring. And it's not just my story, it's going to be your story as well, definitely, as we explore, because this is the stories are just a reflective tool. Okay, it looks like A, uh, it seems to have the lead, uh, so far at least, and OB is catching up. So let me start with my journey, at least for now, uh, without further ado. So uh, I'd like to share um, a couple of aspects of the unlearning journey that have been very significant for me. Um, I did my engineering degree. Uh, with a specialization in renewable energy and sustainability. So what this means was that we were very technical about you, uh, you know, developing innovations and strategies. We were a multidisciplinary uh, technical field and took a lot of pride in being unique and, of course, the saviors of the world. And uh, the keywords that were very, very hot in our uh, learning curve was eco-friendly, green and natural, right? Uh, we were looking at green buildings, green cars, um, green toilets, uh, green roads, green constructions, whatnot, you know, and we, our job was to sort of look at uh, everything from uh, industrial machines to everything and see, and of course the renewables, and to see how do we make them greener and more eco-friendly. And with all the arrogance and pride that I was holding at one point in my life, I was slowly, you know, transitioned out of the, uh, my education and I was sort of at a fork in, of decision in my life, which led me to move and live closer with the indigenous communities in South India. So there was a tipping point in my life when I felt the systems that I was part of and the life that I was leading simply didn't make sense. This was over 10 years ago. And I decided with my partner to just move and learn from the indigenous communities and boy, was that an unlearning uh, introduction to unlearning for me, because here I was with the communities watching and really learning what it truly meant to be in tune with nature, to be self-sufficient, um, autonomous, and to, be, and to truly experience the interconnectedness of life. Um, for, for instance, very simple things that, you know, uh, we used to do as part of the green club and the eco club that we were part of is to you know, do campaigns about telling everybody how to conserve water and statistics about how water would be the next major reason for warfare and all of that, right? So the first home that we took when we went to live closer to the indigenous communities, which were basically a village in a forest, one of the homes that we stayed in was this tiny home with no water supply. So we had to pull water from a well. And that meant I had to like really, it, so the, the well water was also a little deeper, maybe about 20, 30 feet uh, um, down below. So it meant that I had to pull uh, using a rope, small buckets of water, and then add them to a larger bucket and then use them for everything from washing vessels, clothes, and I was a city bred individual who had never seen a village life. And uh, I was sitting there washing my utensils. Uh, the first couple of days, it was cool. You know, I was like, oh, look at me living the rural life and uh, really unlearning my journey. But on day four, day five, shoulders started to ache. Moods went a little bit, uh, you know, uh, crazy. And then there would be times when I just don't feel like using an additional vessel because I know I have to wash it. And then that washing would require me to pull an additional, uh, you know, bucket of water. So slowly over time, I noticed that nobody had to teach me to conserve water. Nobody had to teach me to be minimal. Nobody had to teach me to find, you know, pay attention, to be mindful. It was just part of the process. And in fact, I realized in my city life, what I was doing was to pay separately for a gym and, you know, take care of the food from somebody else. And all my, un my understanding of water was that I turn on the tap and the water comes in, it goes down the drain and that's it. That was the window of knowledge that I had. And here I was being finally able to see the drain systems were also like very, you know, rustic. So we could see where the water is going. I know where, which plant it's going to and what the, and if I throw in soapy water or detergent water, I know the plants are going to die. 
So I also see where the water comes from. And the cycle was complete for the first time for me. And that blew my mind. And similarly, there were like dozens and dozens of experiences every day uh, with a, with an indigenous community is always a day of celebration, learning and reconnection. And just staying present uh, was an overwhelm for me. And this was one major aspect, of course, of, about uh, completely dismantling the ideas of sustainability from food, clothing, shelter, and every fundamental aspect of life, which made me question, what was I really doing with my life? You know, and what did I really know? And I started wondering, do I really know anything at all, really? Or have I just picked up stories and just worked with them and just gone with that? Um, another thing that was really precious to me was to read books. I was a I, avid reader. I used to carry more books in my backpack than the textbooks when I went to school and to university. And then I realized at one point after these experiences that I knew very little about life. Even if I knew about a forest life, I knew about it through somebody's eyes who had written about it from their experience. So what I really felt at one point was that my knowledge was still very secondhand. I mean, it's beautiful to see it through somebody's eyes who was able to see something differently, but it's still secondhand knowledge. And for me, the question was, what does it mean for me to experience those things, those wisdom uh, firsthand? And what does that mean for me? And that was a really scary ordeal because uh, I, I literally thought I'd go dumb because my schooling had taught me that if I don't read books, and you, you're not going to be knowledgeable. And if you're not knowledgeable, you can't contribute to the world. You're not important. And that's a scary idea. And I was in love with, with books more than anything else. So it was uh, a conscious and a painful experiment to just abandon uh, the love of my life at the time, which was one of the greatest breakup stories in my life. Uh, for almost eight years, I just refused to read books. And that meant. I had to learn to live with a certain amount of uncertainty and fear and unknown. And there were points when I started constantly questioning it because when I travel around, people would ask me, have you read this book by this person? You know, this is something really cool. Do you know about this ideology? Do you know about that? And I would be absolutely stunned. And I did feel dumb many times. But what was really happening in the process of learning to live with that uncertainty was that over time, I think I realized some a different form of intelligence, a different way of knowing life started emerging, a way that felt a lot more closer, more authentic, more real to what truly made life beautiful for me. And the kind of experiences that I shared before, like I really learned to connect with the land, I learned to connect with people, I learned to connect with how I live, how I breathe, how I sit, what kind of clothes I wear, where do they come from? And there was so much knowledge to be learned in just learning to pay attention. And suddenly, what was one way of knowing the world suddenly opened up into this, I mean, a, a multitude, a multiverse of possibilities of just knowing life. And that has been like one of the most significant uh, experiences that made me question almost everything from scratch. So my journey over the years has been to really slow down and pay attention to every aspect of life, to not take anything at face value, no matter what, whether it comes from scriptures, whether it comes from books, whether it comes from science, can I slow down and understand how do I relate with it? What is my experience of it? What is my understanding of it? And where does it come from? And, uh, that has been what unlearning has meant for me. So, um, I mean, going back, I'll just check uh, with the, the story that I was wanting to talk about was this uh, whole new world that we are living in, right? Uh, the era of superheroes and super powered people. I don't know if you, if you know the kind of magnitude uh, that of these productions that are happening, not just with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but if you just open any OTT platform or any small scale platform in regional uh, movies across the world and series, everybody wants to have some superpower or the other, right? Like, I even talk to kids who be like, oh, I'll just shoot powers at you and I will fly and I'll go here. And it's not a, it's not a new story, but it has definitely been catalyzed by the mainstream uh, you know, narratives that have happened. 
and i was one of those i've been a big fan of like comic books since my childhood i love watching these movies and it always fascinates me to see oh there's so much power in all of that but over time one of the biggest unlearnings that have happened for me is that i realized that our narratives of superpowers are essentially exaggerations of just our survival methods i want super strength or super speed or i can move from one place to another by flight or maybe become invisible but these are essentially just exaggerations of just the basic survival processes right there is nothing new i would like to read minds and how to and the real question for me became what is it that truly makes us human because you could see that superpower people are not always heroes some people become villains and i started questioning myself uh, questioning this whole narrative of what makes somebody a hero or a villain what what is in the spirit of that and i realize it's very simple for me at least when i look at some of the stories both people in some narratives for example like you know if you are familiar with batman and joker and all of that the characters both people have gone through trauma both people have lost something very important in their life someone very important and they have been scarred through an experience but here's one person saying hey something hurt me really badly and i'm going to make sure that that never happens to anybody else again and i'm going to dedicate my life towards that and somebody else says you know what life scarred me so badly i'm going to make sure everybody understands the pain of that right so it's a, it became a question of seeing it's not just a question of power but it's about how we hold that power how we hold that responsibility and what about that uh, is connected to our humanity so the real question for me became what is the real superhuman uh, super what does it really mean to have a superpower what is truly super about being human and i realized just in my journey of paying attention and exploring life i have learned that the for me at least this is the truth the most brilliant thing brilliant superpower that human beings have is this ability uh, that i would like to call the alchemy of transformation i would like to share a couple of quick instances uh, there is a in the southern yogic tradition which is called the siddhar tradition there is a bhogar is the name of a yogi this person uh, the siddhas were known in the south for being capable of consecrating idols right if you go to many of the south temples in the south these hindu temples these would have been people who added uh, energize the idols of different temples and in such a powerful way that these temples would continue to it they are said to continue to emanate that dissipate that power to people who come in you know creating spaces of of peace and tranquility and energy for those who are willing to receive it so you'll usually see there are uh, small shrines dedicated to the to the yogi who who consecrated the idol so bogar is one of the siddhars from the south south indian tradition who consecrated an idea idol uh, called navapashana which means it uses an amalgamation of nine of the deadliest poisons known to people at the time nine of the deadliest poisons put together in a certain concoction and an idol is made out of that and every time somebody i mean you uh, there is a process of like uh, adding milk or water to just cleanse the idol and also to ener- re-energize the idol it's called an abhishekam so when the water flows through the idol and then comes out uh it has medicinal properties so it is not just a belief it's not just a mythology it's actually like something that people have really wanted to study so what fascinates me i mean this is just the most fascinating story i've heard but in a simple relatable relatable example we can always understand that the snake venom is used uh for treating you know snake bites or we use the same principle of uh, using a weakened virus or a bacteria to give ourselves you know inoculation to diseases so we do uh use what can cause disease can also be healing right what is poisonous can also become medicine this is a knowledge that some people learned how to transform something that that seems to have a nature of you know death how do we turn that into something that becomes uh, life oriented similarly there are uh, other examples as well uh, one is um, 
the okay i don't want to go into details but there is a tantra part where they're talking about five of the of uh, putting five things together and these five practices include alcohol drugs sex meat and something else all these five are known to create a certain sludgy energy in the system right and each of those are almost looked at as a almost a serious no no not because there is moral judgment but in in the yogic traditions the idea is to raise awareness which means the energies have to rise and these have a tendency to weigh down the energies right so if you've ever had a heavy meal made of meat you'll notice that the next few minutes is not going to be very exciting for you because the energy is a little down if you try to create something creative it will usually uh, not work out but it's not just with meat anything that you have heavy that is difficult for the system to process it sort of dulls the system down and it's incredible that they took five of the most heaviest uh, ingredients things that create the maximum heaviness in the human system and created a system of transcendence that can be used for raising the energies up towards enlightenment so this is called the pancham panchamkara uh it is one of the i mean not everybody practices it's very very remote and prescribed for certain people only so uh, don't go experimenting with this but the idea is that it's possible to take something and transform it entirely uh, into something else and people do it all the time there are fantastic stories of people going through trauma they turn trauma into wisdom and that's the whole story of being a superhero and for me what creates that quality in human beings what is that ability to transform what whatever we go through whatever comes our way in life how do we transform that into something brilliant or something that is in tune with our growth this is the same issue that we have with the world as well i feel because whether it's technology ai or nuclear energy whatever it is that comes our way do we really know how to wield it for our well being or are we just using it in a way that is creating chaos and total destruction right so i just go back to the slide for once uh, maybe this will be a good uh, introduction to this idea of what is it mean to get into the art of seeing uh, when and for me this question was always there because uh, if you look at the hourglass below i i realized that for a long time i thought acquiring knowledge made me smarter and made me more knowledgeable i used to read i used to listen i used to look at you know I, i was one of the earliest people in my university who was watching ted talks and downloading them onto hard drives and disks because at the time it was not even uh, public yet so it was a big uh, ambitious project of mine to start acquiring knowledge and over time i realized that no matter how much i acquire up in my head and all this knowledge does not translate to my lived experience i can talk about healing and give advice and suggestions but when i feel traumatized when i am going through something that makes me completely unsettled and afraid then i am absolutely incapable of learning to apply what i've learned and that made me wonder what is that the bottleneck of this transformation how do i translate what i have learned and read and whatever it is that i've taken in into a lived experience what does that even mean and that's when i realized that the only thing that i knew of i still don't have the answer i mean i i i have no answers to offer in the whole session this is not about uh, you know uh, any way offering answers but it's about really paying attention to what could be the possibilities where could we begin and what could be uh, a way forward in 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 the way of experimenting and exploring this space of transition from acquired indirect knowledge to translating it into an effortless lived experience right whether we are doing this taking the spiritual path or the social path it doesn't matter we all in some way in my understanding at least trying to get to live a life or live in a world which is joyful and conducive to the way we want it to be so going back to the art of seeing uh for me i learned that the art of seeing is something incredibly valuable in fact i would go as far as to say that in learning to see something fully and totally and in its in its in its entire depth as we learn more and more to engage with something it has a fundamental ability to transform our lived experience effortlessly one of the most uh, let me just 
see if there's a stories that will come up. Uh, one of the stories that really uh, stayed with me was this story of uh, Ashoka the Great. Uh, he was a king who lived many years ago in India. He's one of the most popular kings uh, and his work is so uh, well known that he spread Buddhism in a big way in the whole of uh, Indian subcontinent and Sri Lanka and some of the uh, South Asian countries. But his story starts off with him uh, engaged in battle in the Battle of Kalinga, uh, where he's like won the battle and he's standing victoriously with his bl uh, blood soaked sword. And then he looks around for a moment in that moment of victory and takes a look at the bloodshed that he has created. And that has been part of this, this violent act of just wanting to expand land and glory and fame and whatnot. And the story goes, at least I don't know what he experienced, but the story goes that in that moment, something shifted within him so fundamentally that when he got back out of that, you know, after the war, he devoted his life absolutely to the ideals of Buddhism and nonviolence and compassion. And he, he was one of the most, and yet he was still successful. He, was, he had one of the largest empires in the, in the country. And even the story of uh, Gautama, the Buddha himself is something like this, right? Then he saw the, uh, the sick and, and the dying and the old and something shifts. So the question is, what in seeing life, what are we really seeing? How are we really seeing? How do we really look at the quality of how we look at life? And is there a possibility for us to really engage with it deeply? Yeah. So in that aspect, I wanted to say, maybe just look at me as I'm talking. And this is an invitation for all of us. Like maybe as I'm talking to you right now, maybe just slow down and pay attention to what's happening within. Maybe you arrived uh, now or a bit earlier. Maybe you expected someone different. Maybe you saw an image. Maybe you had an idea. Maybe you heard my voice. Maybe I look too young, too old, to this way, to that way. Maybe I'm still talking too much more excitedly for a spiritual person or an unlearning person. Maybe you have, you like moments of what I say, don't like moments of what I say, right? And it's interesting to learn to see this uh, from the space of understanding what is the quality in which I am able to receive this moment as it's happening right now, right? Uh, for example, if, if there's a flower, and I mean, I wanted to pluck one, but I didn't feel like doing it uh, just for the sake of the session, but I am sure you guys have all seen a flower. Uh, if there's a flower, and if you look at it in one way, there's an artist is able to look at the art of the flower. There is math in it. There is a sacred geometry to how the petals are arranged and how it creates their colors, their geometrical shapes. So there is art, there is, you know, there is uh, biology, there is, you can go deep enough and understand what are the molecules and, you know, understand the physics part of it. There is food, there is medicine, there is politics to what kind of uh, plants grow. And I'm, my partner works with politics of greens and, and wild edibles and food, and there is design, there is law, there is life. There are so many perspectives in just one flower, right? And each of us get to take away one or two aspects of it when we are paying attention to something. And somehow in the process of it, there comes a state of saying, hey, I know what this is about. And that's one of the fundamental questions that I, I've always wondered, that the first time I see something, and I'm, I'm in this beautiful venue uh, in, in Himachal, close to the Himalayas. And the first time I came here, it was fascinating, the cool breeze and the mountains. And I'm from the South. We, we, we have only three climates where I come from. It's hot, hotter and hottest, right? So this is cool. And it's, it's wintry. It's cold. My fingers are freezing, but I'm excited. And the joy in my heart was so beautiful initially. And then maybe in the fifth or sixth day, I'm a little bit okay with it. Yeah, I know what it's about. And a few more visits here, maybe this is the third time I'm visiting. And I feel like, yeah, I've walked the street. I know what this is about. Oh yeah, this is what we get here. And it's, it's useful knowledge to, to, to travel through the space because I know where I get what and what's safety and what's not. But it sort of takes away the wonder of it for me. 
in fact i was talking to a friend just a few hours ago and she was with her niece and uh, she was telling me she's 2 years old and she's going through an i know phase like oh i know what i'm doing oh this is how you're supposed to use this and, you know i know i know I, i'm just drawing right now oh this is a flower this is a tree and this is what i'm going to take care of it whatever but at that age and and she was talking about how she just discovered this this bag full of colors and she was like oh colors and the excitement of just finding just these color pens and just using them and she was talking to me about how ex- how this excitement is so alive and and beautiful and we were just having an exchange where i was sharing oh that, that looks like the period of transition you know from the joy of seeing just color pens and feeling excitement in the world to getting into the state of saying you know what i know what this does i know i've seen it on youtube i've seen it there i am i'm an adult and adult somehow becomes about i know and uh somewhere along the process i feel what real what are the things that do we really know and how much more is there for us to know is the known coming in the way of us embracing the infinitely more possibilities of all that uh, remains to be seen uh, is it taking away the joy of life because one thing that happens in most of i mean i i run an initiative called unlearning ashram we keep doing these sessions on different aspects of life and often at times i have people saying you know what i've done this ex- you know I, i mean there are just simple games of like trying to get to know each other looking at your life and sharing a story so people come to me some of them are like you know i've done this already so let's do something else let's do something new and exciting i said there's nothing new to do everything that i can offer has been done by somebody in the world all the wisdom and all the things that are really valuable about life has been said by somebody at some point there's nothing new to talk about i mean we're not i mean the idea is not to go for a spiritual shopping experience but that's the that's what the market teaches us right like brand new product and this is the new idea and these are the ways in which we we get programmed and colonized to keep expecting something new and new is beautiful new is wonderful new is exciting and the old is unless it's antique and you're a little eccentric and strange maybe then you're okay you're allowed you're it's okay to do that but otherwise it's always new and for me i feel there is something new it is in how i connect with myself in every different scenario with the same tool if i'm just looking at my life and sharing my life's journey the my story of i'm running that i'm sharing i'm doing it probably for the 100th time but each time i talk about it i still find something new and the way i it lands on me the way i express it the way i experience it is definitely definitely different so in the spirit of talking about something new i know i've been going uh, on for a while just from my end so i thought we'll do a little bit of an activity we've been sitting for a while as well you can do this activity called what is new is the name of the activity but how we'll do this activity is that you can either use your whole body or use just your hands if you're not feeling like it it would be great if you can all turn your cameras on so we would like to see each other uh, for this ac- activity at least the idea is over the next 2 minutes right try to hold your body or just your hands in different ways and formats that you have never seen before not done before but seen before right so you can make new shapes or hold your body in new postures and positions but the idea is to find one stable point where you think i have never created this okay one is you've never created this with your body before but also something that you've never seen before never ever seen anywhere anyone to before so can we just try this experiment for the next 2 2 minutes just get off your seats if you're feeling that you're sitting for too long stretch your body take your time and stay present to just your body and your creativity or if you're not willing to wake up and move around maybe just stand use your fingers and just see if you can create new postures once you create something just stay with it watch it and be with that and see what's really new about it are there elements of that you already recognize are there parts of it that you've already seen before or is it entirely new and once you've spent a few seconds with it make another shape right so you can keep doing this 
and see how many you can do. This is not a competition. You're not going to, everybody can get a, a million points right now. Okay. All of us are in the same place, but we just try and play around and see how many different shapes and postures can we create with just this body and your hands. Do it in your own time and see just for yourself, how does that feel and take some time. Take your time, just be playful, but also very aware of how you're making the formations and anything that's playing out in your heart as you're doing this or in your thoughts. How are you feeling as you're making these shapes? Is there excitement, hesitation, joy? Boredom, confusion, embarrassment, curiosity. Just pay attention to what's happening as you're doing these. We'll take a few more seconds. See how your body feels. Just see whatever posture you're holding. Just stay with it for a few seconds and see what about it feels familiar. What about it feels new. Okay, now gently come back, take your time, just relax your body, take maybe a deep breath and just relax as you exhale. 
Could we hear from anyone who wishes to share maybe a line or two about what you noticed in the process of doing this? Um, what was playing out for you? What were you present to? If any of you would like to share, you can just unmute and just share briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So I felt very crazy to do this because uh, generally people will say like, just be mature and, you know, behave like an adult and don't do you know, crazy things. So whenever we try something different, uh, we immediately get the thought, at least I usually used to hear that don't be crazy. It's very immature of you, right? So I immediately felt very, um, very conscious of what I'm doing, you know. So maybe I'm looking like a joker as if being a joker is a negative thing. So that's what uh, initially came to my mind. Thank you, Gopika. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, hi. I'd like to share. So, so yeah. So I felt the the stiffness in in my body, and I and I realized because I sit so much and I'm hardly move. So, so I felt cracks sometimes mm -hmm. when I move. So, yeah. So it was just yeah. I guess a message to know that I need to be moving and loosening up. So, yeah. That's. That's what came for me. Thank you. Am I on mute? Okay, I'm on mute. Thank you, Michelle. Maybe we can hear a couple of more. Also on the chat, those of you who are not feeling like sharing right now, could you share how many different types of shapes do you were you able to make roughly? Just ballpark somewhere. Three, 25. And once again, I just want to remind you that it's not a competition. Don't worry about slipping into a space of like, oh, should I write this, right? But if something's happening around that, that's a great thing to pay attention to as well. Uh, what's playing out? Yeah. Five, 10, three. I notice the body more as a landscape. Uh, and I notice like, the veins and the skin and how all of those things are so delicately like layered onto each other and how they move differently every time you move and you know based on the pressure you put on that part or um, yeah and I mean I've always been fascinated by the body as a landscape and even you know the details of it like so much of um, the skin we see in media and all is so airbrushed that we forget what real skin actually looks like. So to observe it and see the same kind of patterns that are on bark and on leaves and, you know, uh, roots and just see the world reflected in you and just, you know, being again grounded in the fact that you are a part of nature and there is no such thing as saving nature or, you know, uh, seeing it as separate or seeing yourself as removed from it. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. That was beautiful to hear. Um, is there one more one more sharing we can take? And then we have time for one. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, well, thanks a lot for just that to meet Um I... <laughs> I did I did it, but my camera was off, and that was because uh, I I felt embarrassed. The fact that you know I could be watched while I was doing you know these strange movements, uh, that idea made me feel uncomfortable. And there was a good practice for me to face with these feelings. Um, so I kind of felt like maybe. I should learn more about how to let go. You know, why do I mm. so much? Uh, um, why am I so conscious of myself this much? As uh, as Gobika was saying. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to hear. I think that what what uh, fascinates me as somebody uh, you know journeying with people through spaces like these is that 
it's like watching the flower all over again right it's one activity and then each person's experience is like wham 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 there's so many different perspectives and and insights into just one experience with the human body and that just still makes me extremely fascinated uh, i mean when i when i chose facilitation for for my uh, life's journey I, i i always felt that it it was in tune with the spirit in which i explored the world i always felt like uh, i used to call it being a kid lost in a toy store uh, because for me everything is fascinating but i'm lost i have no idea where to go uh, there is a bit of panic and confusion in the, in the in the whole thing as well but then it's incredible it's like i'm happily lost uh, maybe the yeah so i think for me these are moments that remind me of that energy where there's just insights and i feel all of these are uh, incredibly adding to the the wholeness of the experience as a whole right in in terms of looking at the flower as a whole and we looking at the experience from all sides and for me at least while i was doing this what was present was that initially i was trying to do variations and i realized i was trying to find the because i i've i've been doing these exercises and activities with a few other groups so i was feeling like oh i'm on the hard level because i can't do the ones i've already done before and i'm now you know i have to do it uh, be even more creative so my idea of creativity became twisting and moving things like in incredible incredibly diverse variations and then after a point i realized if i just touch the tip of my finger and create one new you know pause posture i can just move it down a, a millimeter just a little bit and it's another and that's another and that's another i can press a little bit more and then i can loosen it a little bit more there is there is space there is pressure there's there's touch there is movement there's so many factors that i completely missed and why were I, why was i thinking in terms of making something entirely different from each other and that's what i was sitting with as i was doing it right now so i mean it's exciting that i can keep finding these insights each time i do the experiment and play with this activity this activity for me is a small glimpse we've done a similar work with clay with with colors uh, in fact i was uh, doing another workshop uh, where we were we were a lot of artists and people who into uh, you know creation and we were trying to create models with sculptures with clay things that we have never seen before right and then we sort of uh, made these odd little shapes and things and then we sort of put them together into creating this little world of uh, which looked a little alien which looked a little uh, familiar and then we used to try to find interactions between these new things that we we supposedly created and to see how they fit in and what would that mean can we find new ways in which they fit in or are they going to be again the old ideas of what i know and how does that even play out you know and 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 how does working with one group change uh from working with another or working with the same group today versus working with the same group tomorrow and what i have noticed is that each and every moment in each and every group each and every person is incredibly unique and that is i i think for me the most the most beautiful part of the experience um we'll get to that part in in a while but i think as we are getting to this phase of the of the you know workshop or session that we are doing we're going to try and see slow down a little bit and really see what are the nuances of what's happening here um and maybe get a little bit more serious i know i'm sounding so very excited because I, i get very lit up when i do these things but i think there's there's some hard discomforts and inconvenient truths as well along the way that we might need to look at in terms of really understanding what is this block about what comes in the way of me experiencing something afresh and what is the nature of this whole idea of newness right because the newness that i talked about earlier was a detrimental newness unless something is new i don't feel excited about life because my sensitivities have gone down so much if I, it's not something new i don't feel excited i don't feel alive and i keep looking for something new experiences and new ways and new new means but newness is also something that we really have to look closer and deeper which we do i just share uh, maybe the screen because it's easier for me to keep track of where we are at so in the 
in the whole idea of talking about the mind and how it behaves one of the most beautiful uh, things that i came across which was in tune with my understanding also was how yoga looks at the mind uh, the yogic system looks at the mind into in terms of many components because when you really look at the mind uh, we're asking when we're talking about the new we have to create something that does not draw from the past right and when yoga looks at the mind it talks about different aspects of the mind it talks about a part of the mind that is purely based on memory which is recycling memory over and over and over again in unique permutations and combinations and uh, oh i think i skipped a slide anyway uh, and there is a part of the mind when we say the mind one of the things that i have noticed is that the mind is not just silly here the english language uh, translation for the mind seems almost parallel to the idea of brain right um just one second i think i'm getting a message from mahik all right just give me one second yes. all right so uh, what you are basically doing is to understand is there a part of my mind is there a part of my intelligence that's beyond and unaffected by memory if you really look at it um if you create something new we're essentially using the same ingredients and then creating something new when i was in school we were studying you know something about the atoms and my my sir was trying to explain uh the shapes that the electrons form around the nucleus so he said one is a spherical shape the other one is a dumbbell shape the other one is a double dumbbell shape and then he said there's one more shape and i was curious being the eager student that i was i was like but i want to know what that is and he dismissed me by saying you can i can't explain it to you because there is nothing to compare it to and it sort of stayed with me you know i sort of slowed down and asked what does that mean you know does that mean that i cannot really explain or understand something if i have not seen it before how do i describe something new if i don't have anything to compare it to and describe it based out of so if i'm tasting a new dish i have to say in terms of you know you you tried that thing you know you tried the instant noodles it's sort of like that but it's also creamy like this but then you put two together it's sort of like you know combination between this and that so if you look at how language works and communication happens we're constantly working with the known in terms of how we understand interpret and look at the world it happens to a large extent that uh, with it almost seems like without without the backing up of data like the machines work right without data in the background it is impossible to apply intelligence and that's where this idea of uh, what yoga calls as chitta but we can look at it irrespective of all the labels and terms there is an aspect of the human intelligence that is free from the burden of the known right and different cultures look at it differently in my understanding some people call it zen some people call it meditativeness some people call it mindfulness some people call being present but what that essentially means is absolutely being present to what i'm experiencing without really breaking it down into the new right and when you go back to what you are doing with with creating shapes and postures if you really pay attention what's really happening is that we're still working even in creation we're still trying to put two and two together so if i say maybe i start with a shape like this the very idea of putting these fingers together is from a certain memory right i can i can only put it together in ways that i've already thought of or i've already experienced or i know as possible i never think of bending my finger backwards because i've never done that before right because i know this is how it works and that's the knowledge that i'm using and i'm creating things with what i uh, create so that part of creation is definitely drawing from memory but the experiences of what we are we are going through while we are creating is incredibly unique and it is happening in that moment in fact what fascinates me about this whole uh, journey of reimagining learning and education for myself is 
what's happening within me is one of the most unique experiences on the planet. How I'm experiencing this session, this moment, maybe we both have something spicy to eat. Uh, and the spice part, if I say, oh, it's so, it's so hot. And you might understand the same heat that I'm going through, but only from your experience, right? You and I will never be able to be 100% on the same page about what exactly it is that I am experiencing. So, which means my fear, my joy, my struggle, my sensation is incredibly unique. And it is so unique, not just in terms of space that other people cannot experience what I'm going through, but it is also unique in the fact that it is unique through time. I cannot remember, I cannot compare what was or what will be in terms of what I'm going through right now all the time, only very limited uh, times will I be able to do that so what this means is what we are going through in the moment is something that nobody through time and space can ever know whether they're enlightened beings or scientists or uh, you know artists or, or whoever it is they can never really experience what I'm experiencing which means it's incredibly valuable even if you go by market standards that it's it's more precious than anything else in the market but somehow We've learned to ignore that. That is the thing that we end up ignoring most, right? Which brings us to uh, the next part of how we apply and what kind of impact this kind of a mindset that is constantly drawing from the limitations of the known is impacting in the world we live in because the world we live in impacts us and how we are impacts the world in some way. We're just going to take a look at some of that. Before we go into that, I wanted to share that uh, the session is going to be a little longer because we uh, the assigned time for the session is about two, two and a half hours. But I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of what we'll be doing. We'll be looking at how this idea of the known coming in the way and what kind of systems have emerged from this kind of a limited way of looking at life without freshness, without without presence, without aliveness? And what are the systems that have emerged through this and how have they impacted each other? This will be a small part and then we'll do one more activity. And then we look at uh, a way in which, like I feel for me, a, a lot of times there's a lot of despair that comes in the way. Oh, if, if you know, I'm so conditioned and I'm so broken down, is there no way forward? And I thought we'd actually look at what are some possibilities to explore, to start reversing the process. And that's where unlearning comes in. So we'll just look at a couple of experiential activities for ourselves to see how can we begin this journey of unlearning by connecting with different aspects of ourselves more in the present. So that will be a bit of a lot of body work. We'll, that will be the closing part, which will be a significant chunk of maybe a 30 minute or 25 minutes of just an experiential activity where we'll be using the body and the breath and our awareness. With that, uh, we'll bring the session to a close, right? So we are about halfway through the session. We might uh, end early also, but just wanted to give you a sense uh, of what is uh, yet to come. And in, in meanwhile, if you feel like you need to stretch your body, you need to walk and listen or just uh, move around, feel free to do that. That's always welcome. Uh, if at all possible, I think maybe we'll, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll have another, uh, I think, activity in a couple of, maybe five more minutes. So then we'll see, oh, 15 more minutes. And then we'll see if that also helps us like move around a little bit together. Um, but for now, we will sort of like just take the time out to just go a little deeper into the applications of what happens because all of this is good for understanding for me. Oh, this is how I think and this is what's coming in the way. But what, what matters to me really is that, is this really impactful? What is really doing to me and the world? And what am I really creating? And what I'm sharing is mostly from my perspective and perception of what I've seen and observed in the world. But as you're traveling with me, I would invite you to see if you can connect it to your own life experience and your journey and your insights. Because after the uh, activity that we'll be doing, I would love to open the space and hear what has been present for you, what's, what's been your truth and your reality. That would be also the tail end of the work that we'll be doing today. Yeah. So for now, um, let me just share this particular slide yes yeah here we go for me what happens uh, when we get into a space of 
knowing or even recognizing that there is a way to be present to something beyond the compulsions of memory means to really understand what comes in the way of experiencing this moment, which is why I was saying, even as you're sitting in the session, I want you to see what are all the churnings that are happening. Maybe you feel like you're sitting for too long. Maybe you feel like uh, this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is an important thing or an unimportant thing. Whether it's this way or that way, we constantly, the mind is trying to relate, compare, and try to make sense of what's happening. And in the process of drawing from the past, maybe you've sat in a session like this, uh, which, was, which worked for you or didn't work for you, and that creates a certain kind of bias. And that impacts the way we experience the session right now. And when intelligence starts constantly drawing from a sense of the known and the memory, and it recycles it, depending on how compulsive it is, you know, uh, what happens is it gives birth to biases, distortions, and decep deceptions of all kinds, which means I'm unable to see things for what it is. With, once I see an incomplete picture of everything around me, now I need, I get this innate sense of incompletion, right? I feel like I, there is a sense of not knowing, but I don't want to accept it because I feel like I, 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 it, I need to be valuable that way. So I fill in the gaps with belief systems, dogmas, or theories. Essentially, when we say belief, the very nature of the word belief is that it, it is rooted in the I don't know, right? You, you only know, you only believe something that you don't know. If I had to ask you, um, you know, a difference between maybe sex and gender, if you have, are a male or female, all you have to do is just see if you are taking a look at your body and your organs and your genitals and get a sense of it and say it. But this is very present in the body, but when you're talking about a gender, it, it is about an experience, it's about an identity, it shifts completely. It is a question of your culture, it's a question of how you connect, it's a question of something you know, uh, much more complex. Similarly, when you're looking at the belief systems that we have created, a lot of it is in terms of one direct perception and you know, experience of what is, and the rest is to sort of look at how do I bridge these gaps with ideas, theories, and maybe belief systems, and all these isms and ists that come up. I'm a this ist and a, that is, you know, uh, maybe whatever it is. I don't want to name anything right now and get into trouble. But uh, all of these uh, ideas, if you've noticed, the most beautiful thing between two people is that they can always find a common thread. Right, it's just the fact that you're alive and I'm alive, or you're, you're you were living and I am I am life itself is a wonderful thread. That that means there is absolutely always a platform and a bridge for us to connect. And if we find more connections, it's wonderful because all we sometimes need to form connections are just one little circuitry, right? Um, whichever aspect of nature that you're looking at. If it's at least two little vines touch each other, they'll sort of um, connect. Two little wires touch each other, there's enough electricity passing through. Different ways, just all it needs is just one connect. But what happens somehow, I feel, is that with the identities, maybe you and I agree on 99 uh, things, but there's one thing that you believe differently from my belief, and somehow we end up in a conflict. So the the major conflicts of the world, in my opinion, have not between have not been between good and bad. It is just one person's belief versus the other person's belief. One person's right versus another person's right. And it's not really a question of right and wrong. Uh, so where does this sense of limitation emerge for us? For me, at least when I looked at myself, I realized that I was trying to fill in gaps. And these gaps stemmed from incomplete perception of things because I settled quickly into the known. Oh, I know this. That means it's incomplete. It's already done. And when there is incompletion, I make up stories to fill it because it's very intuitive. Life knows that it's not complete yet. My perception of things. And the moment I slip into belief, it invariably leads to prejudice, exclusion, and oppression. Because now there is, depending on what kind of power dynamic is playing, I either oppress or feel oppressed, right? And uh, or go through this dance uh, in, in, relation, in relationship with the other, two halves trying to figure out uh, ways to stay sane with their sense of not really knowing, but not really knowing how to stay comfortable with that not knowing. 
if that makes sense. Yeah. And this is something that I observed when I looked around as well. Uh, the difference between living a life of surety and clarity. Um, I've grown up all the time being told that, hey, if you're really sure, you know, you just fake it till you make it. If you're out there in the world, you can just go out there and, and just talk about stuff as if you know it and people will value. I go through this all the time when I'm traveling. Uh, I feel like, uh, I mean, I, just the way I interact with people somehow makes them think that they can, they have to teach me something or the other. And, I, and most of the time I'm happy, but sometimes I'm just not ready to receive at the time. But it happens as they talk, I realize that, okay, maybe you've done, explored something for a bit, but it comes from this authority of like, yeah, yeah, I've done everything. You know, I was remembering that two-year-old kid uh, with that energy of like, I know, I know how it's done, you know, how it's, how it's supposed to be drawn. And that comes from a certain innocence. But I think as we grow older, there is this urge to prove something out there. Uh, and uh, there is this uh, energy of wanting to be sure of everything because somehow if we, it feels like this, if we can barge through life. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these social experiments where people just pretend, oh, this is a very interesting uh, example. Recently in India, somebody pretended to be from the government and received top military security uh, to go and visit uh, a state, a couple of states in the north three times for three whole tours accompanied by military personnel of the highest security just because this person just threw attitude around and just pretended to be a senior officer going for inspection nobody asked him for an id card nobody asked to confirm only after three whole tours people found out that that guy was a complete fake it was a scam altogether right and it works it works so well uh, especially in my context at least that if you just pretend that you're knowing what you're doing a lot of times uh, things just seem to fall into place, which for me, it's, I'm laughing about it, but to be honest, I, I see that as a sign of some profound sickness in the society, because that means we've really sold our intelligence to the loudest voice, to, to this most surface level appearance of things. And, we've, and that to me seems connected to all the mishap that has happened in the world. So, the, the energy of surety is definitely rooted in security. And if you notice one strong component of this surety is that it always needs numbers, right? If you have enough, I mean, the saying goes that if you have enough fools around nodding to everything that you say, then you feel enlightened. So <laughs> it feels like it doesn't matter what you say, but as long as enough people do the same thing, it seems to work. And I have found this really sad and fascinating that a lot of the times when I notice, when I have conversations with individuals and see how they behave in communities and groups, it's very different because there's always this worry about, I know something isn't good enough for me. I mean, I went to an engineering college. Uh, and there's a trend in the last 10, 15 years that so many of the engineers dropped out because they didn't want to continue engineering. And each person, as they went into the college, they knew that this is not what they want to do. But the only reason they do it is like everybody else is doing it. Uh, it's as simple as you stepping out of the house and seeing everybody in the streets running towards something. And you might maybe take a moment and ask, hey, what's going on? Why are you guys running and whatever? But if people are really in a state of panic and there's a lot of race and something's moving, the first instinct is to run. You don't even want to know what it is about. right? And in some way, the numbers have such a strong influence. It works as long as it's about survival. Yeah, maybe there's a flood and nobody has time to talk, but that's great. But we've designed our entire world to world in a, such a way that we're all probably running through the rat race or markets. It feels like humanity seems to be rushing towards something. Uh, I don't know what really, but I have to dig the planet. I have to transform the planet. I have to do this. I have to create that. I have to, you know, I mean, I mean, just watching how AI has been going on. Uh, now, major players are saying, please slow down because we don't know what the hell we're doing and it's going to go out of hand too soon. It's like, it's going to be like a science fiction nightmare. But people are like, you know, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So I have to get on top of the game. I have to be ahead of the curve and some, I'm not going to stop. I don't know what we're really rushing towards, but it seems to be the trend everywhere. In contrast to surety, of course, uh, I don't want to go into again and read this page, but clarity seems to 
be able to stand in on itself. And I think for me, the switch of moving from surety to clarity has been a huge one. Uh, it might not have great social survival value, which I'm, ex I'm learning the hard way. But things that you do know, you're really sure of. Uh, I mean, nobody needs to, uh, you don't feel doubtful if you have two hands, right? It's just two hands. You can just see it. This is clarity, right? Uh, but if I ask you, are you beautiful? Are you, you know, uh, do you think you're a nine out of 10, eight out of 10? Then there's a little bit of question because it's, it's a competitive mind that comes into play. It's not a simple presence that just says, hey, I can sense, I can feel, it's there, I'm present. This is, these are my hands versus asking, oh, what am I? You know, how pretty am I? How beautiful, how handsome am I? What is, you know, uh, and, and then that goes into a different state altogether. And this is the last part of, uh, I think, one of the systemic frameworks that I think we have fundamentally, uh, that has emerged in a big way um, that I, I look at as colonization. Of course, yes, they have found different expressions right, through race, through caste, through class in different contexts. But primarily, for me, the fun part is just to notice that the mind seems to assign values uh, differently to different uh, things. What is, I mean, what is just the diversity of life? If you walk into a forest, there are grasses, uh, shrubs, plants, trees, mountains. Each of them have their own role to play. Each of them are beautiful. Each of them are connected. But it's only a, a, a mindset of hierarchy that goes and says, who is bigger? Is the tree better than the grass? Or is this better than that? which is what we've done to our schooling systems and all the other systems on the planet. Is this race better than that? Is this gender better than that? This idea of putting one on top of the other uh, without really understanding the context of it. For example, if you want to have uh, you know, a, a view, a distant view of where you are, you have to climb the tallest tree. Yeah. So there is definitely a good option and a bad option. You don't climb the shortest tree. So there is, a, there is a better and worse for a specific context. But without the right context, if I simply go into a forest and ask which tree is better, which tree is big, you know, uh, more important, that makes no sense. But somehow that's what we seem to have done in many aspects of how we look at life. Uh, I'm living in a space which, is, which has a lot of monks and nuns walking around. And I notice that the locals uh, have this really funny habit of they'll be happy having a conversation with me and then the way their body language changes immediately when they see a monk and a nun and then they, there's an immediate assignment of power right and then they turn back and again I'm, I'm a local versus a foreigner so this is just walking around the space I'm watching how strongly my own friends who have no idea what I do about my work with my work have sometimes just see somebody uh, uh, and they have like a certain uh, you know, people around them, of course, numbers, and there are people around and talking to them, and then immediately they assign value. They don't even know who the person is, but there's somebody that must be somebody important. And, uh, and this is a friend they were sharing time moment with, and suddenly the energy shifts. So this is a fundamental thing that happens constantly in, in our everyday life. And I don't want to make a theory about this, but my invitation for us is to watch how much and how deeply this is happening in every moment of our day-to-day -day life. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting about this uh, aspect of colonization is called the thingification. Uh, and thingification is a, is a paradox by itself. I'll explain why. Because say, for example, uh, I'm doing this session and maybe I'm full of self-doubt. I feel like, oh my God, am I? I go to a friend and say, you know, I'm just going through this concern and worry will I be able to do the session well um, I'm just uh, really wanting to understand if people would think I stole this from some book or uh, if if people would think that you know this is not authentic maybe I'm just talking and this is not my true experience How should I make them believe blah 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 and then my friend would probably nod and say you know what this is called the imposter syndrome and I've read all about it and in the moment they name that and then there's a title about that the power shifts completely. And I look at them and say, oh, is that, an, is that, what is that about? Could you tell me more about it? 
could you tell me what this imposter syndrome is all about? I am the one with the experience going through the imposter syndrome in actuality, in lived experience. But somebody has named it and has an, a secondhand knowledge of it. Now I'm seeking knowledge from them about what is it and what are the symptoms and how to deal with them and uh, well, how does it go about or what's really happening inside of me, you know? And they seem to be sharing from a space that's completely unauthentic. I mean, inauthentic, sorry. But that's how it is, right? Uh, and these labels start mattering so much. I, I can't have a relationship with somebody without trying to put it into a certain label. It's almost like my mind would go insane if I don't label it somehow. And if somebody asks me what I do, which has been one question I've struggled with all my life, uh, what am I? I, I? I just struggle to say, am I a writer, thinker, facilitator? Uh, just doesn't make sense to me after a point because I'm not, I do all of those. I walk, I, I facilitate, I sing, I play, but I'm not, a, I'm not a this or a that. And sometimes I wonder when people say thinker, writer, maybe someday we'll get into sitter, walker, sleeper. I don't know where this is going. And what are all these labels that you're really carrying? Uh, for me, it has been that if I want to call myself a thinker, I would love to say that I know how, I have the ability to shut down my thinking. If I really want to not think and be present, I have that ability. And I would call that person a thinker because then they know how to consciously apply their thinking. But most of the time, a thinker seems to be somebody who just thinks and thinks and thinks and thinks. And it sounds very compulsive. It feels like uh, it's out of hand sometimes. So the real question for me is how do I hold these labels? How do I, am I in the process of learning about life constantly jam packing the diversity and the bounty of life into my little framework of how I want things to be, right? And that's a question uh, that I've often sat with. And I think when I, as I work with people uh, with whether it's self-care work or with social change making or education, I think the fundamental struggle that almost all human beings that I have journeyed with seems to have is just one thing. Life is not happening according to the way they expect or they imagine. That's all. Things are not just happening, but it's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. But, but why can't it be this way? But why is life, but why is this happening to me? Something has not fallen into place according to their little idea of how life should be. And it's like trying to force fit the ocean into my water bottle. It's never going to work. I can just dive into the ocean. That's a different work altogether. But the other way is never going to happen. So uh, as long as this nature of mindset is there, and I want to say this nature of trying to grab everything and put it into a small container is an energy of conquest. Right? It comes from a deeply rooted insecurity that I feel validated and valuable only when I hold something precious because I myself am not precious by my own nature. And we've seen oh, in history over time that people have gone through this phase in many different ways. Right? I feel there is, seems to be this black hole that I'm trying to fill with, with knowledge, with people, with fame, with wealth. Uh, but it just never seems to fully fill, uh, probably because it's imaginary. Uh, that's the only explanation I have. But uh, it seems to be there. It seems to be the way I feel complete in some way, right? So this is the last framework I wanted to just share with you for today before, uh, as part of the understanding aspect of work that we are doing around unlearning. This is like sort of a spectrum, you know, of how I look at life. As an individual, the way I interact and look at life is connected to different levels and layers of how I interact with the world. Uh, for instance, let's take the upper half. Uh, I'm an individual and when I'm with my family and friends, I have a certain level of impact in the space. For example, if I want to decide what I want to eat for eat tonight for dinner, then I have a certain say in creating that, uh, making that happen, right? Maybe there's a, there's a family of three, then I have a, I mean, let's do a very rough, it's not, it's not accurate, but roughly speaking, there's about 
one third of a say I have in a three people family. Maybe it's a family of 10 people. I have one tenth of a say about what should be made for dinner. And as we step into the larger and larger spheres of life, our impact in the world is, you know, in some way changing. Uh, if I have to decide something for the whole neighborhood, I'll have a slightly smaller say, but a significant say, nevertheless. And when I try to vote for creating the government, I have, in India at least, I have one and 1.2 billion uh, say in what happens, uh, who, who becomes the next representative. And similarly, my extent of influence and connection and impact seems to keep diminishing uh, in, as we look at the larger and larger spheres of life. In fact, if I want to transform the world, if I want to transform my country, if I want to transform the community, if I want to transform my family, my ability to transform that is already limited by design. And for good reason too. I would never like to live in a world where one person determines how the world should be for the rest of the 7 billion people. That's called dictatorship. And that's not the way I would like to live in. Uh, but it's good that none of us will fully get what we want uh, in, in terms of how we like to reshape the world. But we still have a power and how we use that creatively, consciously determines what kind of a world we create. And if you look at the bottom half, uh, it's supposedly going into the inner aspects, again, from the gross to the subtle. Initially, it's just the body. We can pay attention to what's happening very physically. It's very in your face uh, experience of what's present for you. And then the thoughts and subtler uh, layers of emotions and then energies. These are at least in my experience the four aspects of what's happening within me. Uh, yoga also looks at it this way. But what I've come to see over time is that these aspects of how I keep my body, thoughts, emotions, and energies are entirely in my hands. Right? I'm not saying, uh, for example, how I might not be able to uh, move my body you know, beyond its design, but how I experience something in my body how I take it is completely with me. How I maintain this body is completely with me, right? Uh, and what kind of thoughts I create, like we have talked about the thoughts and emotions that we are going through is incredibly unique. And these are things that nobody else can put their hands in and actually change unless we allow them to. At least by design, this is how it seems to be. But if you really look at how, it, how these relate to each other, at least in my experience, uh, the line that that is in between both of these spheres is the line I feel is the imaginary line between this inner inner world and the outer world. But for me, it is also the line of reflection because as I'm able to stay free from my own burdens and distortions of the known, I feel uh, I will be able to better address the situations out there. Because if my mind, my views, my, the way I hold my body, my thoughts, my emotions and energies are distorted and incomplete by their own nature, invariably, it will impact the way I determine uh, the world and the family. And you can, we can see that in so many ways already happening across the world. Yeah, um, in, in the whole history of the universe, uh, there's this beautiful concept called uh, the cosmic calendar, which takes 13.6 billion years of the universe's history and compresses it into one, uh, one year, calendar year, right? And in that one calendar year, one second attributes to about 4, 475 years or something like that. So you can see different uh, items on the calendar, like New Year's Day, 12 o'clock is the Big Bang. And somewhere in August, the earth is starting to, uh, the solar system is starting to form. In September, October, you know, the earth is now cool enough for life forms to emerge. And by December, uh, up to around December the 20th or 14th, the first mammals are walking the planet, right? And seven days, that's the amount of time that the dinosaurs have existed on the planet. And you know who comes in last? On December 31st, 11.54 p.m., just six minutes before midnight, the first uh, traces of this species called uh, humanity is emerging. And all the modernity that we have created in the world is just the last four seconds uh, of the calendar. That means in this last four seconds, we've transformed the planet, ruined in numerous species, 
made them extinct. We've created global warming. We've fought wars. We forget damaging the planet and other creatures. We've damaged our own species, right? Uh, we've oppressed. We've gone through loads and loads and loads of problems. But at the same time, we've also created moments of beauty, moments of grace, moments of power, moments of uh, connection. But very quietly, it's happening. And the real question for us is, how do I hold myself in a way that I know the difference of how to apply myself in the world? And how does, how does unlearning come in the way? Uh, and for that, the most important point for me is to learn to live with the sense of the unknown. How do I stay comfortable with uncertainty? And how can I not compulsively try to escape pain and discomfort? Because in escaping that, I resort to dogma, belief, stories, and in invariably that leads to problems. So we'll try a quick, uh, simple activity, which will also help us stretch a little bit. This inv invites us to sort of stand up um, and if you can just move a little bit. I might have to move my uh, camera also a little bit, but let me see. So what we are basically trying to do is take stand with your feet parallel. Maybe you relax a little bit with your body and take a deep breath, inhalation. And as you exhale, just gently relax your body. If you feel like you need to stretch, you've been sitting for a while, you can just stretch and feel comfortable. Make sure that your body is a lot more settled. Now, what we'll essentially try and do is just very slowly and mindfully, we'll try and connect the movement of the hands and the arms with the breath. So for instance, with slow inhalation, and steady inhalation, I, as I inhale, I just raise my arms forward and see if by the end of my inhalation, my arm is above and then exhale and then relax the arm down. So we'll do it in a, in a way that you take a deep, slow, gentle breath. But as your inhalation is completed, you should adjust your pace in such a way that your arm reaches the topmost point. And then as you exhale, it gently comes down. Yeah, so we'll start with one arm first, maybe start with the left or right and take a, keep your eyes closed and just pay attention to see. Inhale and in, raise your arm all the way up. Exhale. Slowly, fully, all the way down. Inhale. all the way up and exhale. Let there be a free movement of your body. See if you can just connect with your breath and slowly notice how your body movement and your breath will find its own dance. You can do alternative arms, one arm first and then the other. As you're exhaling, just make sure the rest of your body is also relaxing much more at ease, bring your body to ease. Please continue doing this for a few more seconds. Wherever you are, if you can, if you're sitting down, you can still sit and raise your arms in front or to your sides, you can choose whatever feels comfortable for you. But as long as the inhalation and exhalation is connecting with the raising and lowering of your arms. Try not to bend your elbow.
And as you raise your arm right now, with the next inhalation, as you raise above, just keep the arm raised above your hand, straight up vertically. And just continue to breathe normally, but just leave your arm above your hand, above your head. Slowly bring it down to your shoulder height on the side, on one side. And breathe normally. Gently start noticing the sensations that are happening to your hands, to your arm. Keep it steady if you're not listening. Temperature changes, other forms of sensations like pricking, numbing, throbbing. Just see how far you can hold the, your hand this way. If you notice discomfort happening, just see if you can pay attention to all the dance that's happening in your mind, in your body, as the discomfort spreads, as the pain starts, notice your urge to drop your hand, notice your urge to just let go, to relax, to evade and escape this discomfort, this pain. Just pay attention to what's happening inside of you and slowly bring your attention as well to the sensations of pain and discomfort happening in your arm and your shoulder. See how far you can push yourself with the discomfort and notice all the thoughts and emotions that are playing out in your body as you're staying with this. Every time you feel like you're done, just take a second more, just push it just a second or two more and see, is it possible to be present to that extreme discomfort and pain when it becomes absolutely unbearable, you can slowly start reducing, lowering your hand very slowly. Take your own time, only when you feel that you've reached your limit, very, very slowly, you can lower your arms. Those of you who lowered your arms, try not to make any sudden movements. You can very gently, slowly relax your arm. Just pay attention to the sensation as your arm is resting. As you lower your arms and as you leave it by your side, just pay attention to the sensations. Relax your body consciously and your arms just consciously without any sudden movements. Deep breath and as you exhale, you can just relax your body consciously. Just put your attention where there is discomfort and strain and just with your awareness, ease your, that part of your body. Simple adjustments are fine. Take your time. Whenever you feel ready, you can just come back.
anyone who feels like sharing any experiences, we can just hear them out. We can go to the tail end of the session. But if any of you feel like sharing, maybe just in the chat box, you can just share that. Meanwhile, um, just wanted to share that learning to sit with discomfort for me is a key part of how I shape my unlearning journey because without really learning to stay present to one thing totally, absolutely, even at the cost of all the distractions that are happening, life does not yield, wisdom does not emerge, at least in my experience. And uh, this requires me to step out of the comfort zone and to really challenge myself at times, but not to the point where I would break down completely. So to learn to find that fine line between this extreme and that, and to see how do I really reconcile in that space between. Uh, this is a very essential and experiential part of the unlearning process. And what we did today was a physical experience of this discomfort, uh, but this happens every time our images, ideologies, beliefs, uh, assumptions, conclusions are threatened in any way. Yeah. Uh, this might make us to make and break friendships and bonds. It might enable us to create and end projects, uh, change how we are, how we feel our mood swings, uh, or how we relate to ourselves as well in the process. Right. So the question is also an invitation for each of us to, if you're, if you're considering unlearning as a way forward, to really uh, know life beyond the limitations of the known. One of the key things is to learn to truly uh, learn the art of being with things, right? Whether you're being with the breath, whether you're being with your body, being with yourself, just learning to be with something is incredibly important. And that is a lost art uh, that I feel uh, is, is a challenge um, today, especially in the fast pace of life that we are in, the kind of situations that we are creating. And if you're really looking at the kind of known and unknown, one of the things that matters most, I feel, in the, in the way we shape our experience and the experience of the world is the ultimate and the mother of all the unknowns. Uh, that is death. And for me, this is, uh, I just don't want to go into details this time. I just very briefly touch upon it. For me, uh, it is as life, the only known that all life I feel in some sense knows that it's just that whatever is going on right now will end. And we know this not because of some study or uh, by somebody has told us, but simply because We've seen death happen around us and also death happens within us. What uh, we thought of, the way we thought yesterday was not the way we think today. The friendships we had yesterday is not the friendships that we have today. The nature of what we are and how we hold things keeps changing every day, which means what is will someday come to an end. And in some sense, that's the only known that is guaranteed. Otherwise, in if you really look at it philosophically, we don't even know if you're awake or asleep, right? Uh, but that's too much into, yeah, uh, uh, inquiry. But for now, the, the idea of holding something as delicate as death, which is the only known, but that's the one thing that we know absolutely very little about, about what happens, what goes on after that, because there's nobody who came back and spoke yet. Uh, and there's, there's just, that's the space where you'll see in, in the world where there's a lot of, uh, you know, stories coming in. And in a very brief way, I think it's, I think I, may, I needed to mention this as part of, if you're mentioning the unknown, I think it is important to honor this because death is not just the end of life, but also in, in as it is in some way talking about impermanence. It is in some way talking about our ability to really embrace the possibility that things are and can be uh, impermanent and, and there will be a discomfort about things from time to time. There will be pain of loss, pain of failure, pain of losing. And that is very much 
are going to determine how we shape the what is and what is life. And if you really look at the world, you will see, and I'll leave this up to you, but the designs that we have created, you know, uh, whether it is economic, social, educational, uh, whether we're looking at financial security, social security, uh, whatever it is that the, that the energy of conquest. And today we have countries who are constantly patrolling borders. And we, we as humanity, the species spends its maximum uh, time and energy creating money that goes into war and defense. And this is basically a question of me pointing my gun at you and you pointing my gun at me and saying, if you shoot, I'll fire. If you fire, I'll shoot. And nobody's actually shooting, but nobody wants to. Some people want to, but there's just this stalemate and people keep loading themselves up with more and more guns and looking at each other and saying, hey, I might come at you any moment, right? Uh, but that's why we seem to be putting the majority of our resources and time. And that's a reflection of how our designs are reflecting of how uh, of how uh, we hold our sense of impermanence within us. And for me, it's definitely connected to our stories around death. So I won't go further into this aspect, uh, but I just wanted to say, irrespective of what we're holding and what we are experiencing, whether it becomes a tool for our growth or it doesn't become a trap that uh, enslaves us and creates, you know, all sorts of misery within and without us is the real question and that is where i feel unlearning comes into it and the unlearning as a process for me is about really slowing down and understanding how do i recognize these traps right and it's very difficult sometimes because i'm the person uh, i have my own biases i and i am sometimes not able to see what i'm going through but it is possible to find a way to notice without the burden of the known, if you're able to start paying attention, I have noticed for myself that my ability to see uh, how I trap myself in different moments and how biased I can get and how distorted my perceptions have been slowly starts easing up. And there is hope for me in that space because I am no longer enslaved to my ideas of what I'd like, the, like me to be, like life to be. There is a certain ease that comes into the place. And this definitely means sensing into the presence because uh, this is the only part of the intelligence that is not sullied by um, memory and uh, the past. And that allows us to be truly creative because if we want to really self-design life, if you want to design and shape our lives the way we want, what do we shape? That I mean, how can we shape something without really understanding what is it that we are playing with? If it's clay that you're working with, you need to understand the nature of clay. If you are shaping something else, you need to understand the nature of what you're shaping. And the most important thing about shaping life is to really learn to pay attention to life. And for me, shaping life is not, uh, the question really is, am I shaping life consciously in tune with sensitivity to life? Or am I really just shaping life out of a compulsion? And again, going back to the fear of pain and the fear discomfort of the unknown. And I'm quickly, you know, trying to figure out uh, just how do I shape this life? Okay, I need to figure out a few degrees and I need to make some money. I need to have some friends. I need to party and release this energy. What am I really doing with shaping my, my own life and this world around me? And what is the quality and nature in which I'm doing that? Comes back over and over again. To how we hold ourselves. So this gives me hope in some way that as I learn more and more to sense, I increase my ability to sense and to stay present, uh, my ability to pay attention to my traps increases and my fear goes down because I'm learning to be more and more comfortable with the unknown. And unknown is the only fear that we have uh, like fundamentally, I feel. And as there is ease with that, I feel true creative expression can blossom because I, I feel without where there is fear, creativity just cannot thrive or true creativity cannot thrive because it needs a certain freedom of expression and unboundedness is what the nature of creativity itself is. And uh, fear is just a counterproductive energy of like holding that down and they can get very counterproductive with each other. Yeah. So yes, this is the final activity I wanted to invite everybody to try. 
Um, we'll do this activity very quickly, maybe you just as you're sitting. But before that, um, the originally the idea was to do it in a slightly larger uh, space, but we'll do a very small activity right now for just a 10 minute, I think by uh, there's other sessions also starting. So we'll close soon. The idea is just to see if you can sit comfortably wherever you're sitting, however you're sitting, and just keep your palms open, facing upwards. And just pay attention to the senses in your body, the sensations in your body, as we are looking at different moments from our life. Or maybe we'll do this, maybe just look back at your experience of the session today and just see how has it been for you? What were the moments of joy? Just see if you can notice the moments of joy, if at all any, and see which parts of your body is lighting up. Where do you sense it in your body? What were the points of discomfort? Of fear? Did you notice there were moments of fear today at some point? Could have been a simple or complex fear, big or small, doesn't matter. But if you noticed moments of fear, can you go back and be present to those moments and see how they land in your body? Are there moments of anxiety, panic? If you can't connect with this during, from the session duration, you can also think about it from your recent past. The important thing is that you connect with the emotion and just notice it in your body. Did you notice moments of restlessness today? Maybe frustration? What about moments of resonance? where something really clicked, you felt very connected. Moments of stillness and peace where you felt relaxed, maybe in your mind, your body. When you feel ready, just gently take a deep breath and exhale slowly. And gently come back.
please take your time whenever you're ready gently you can come back and those of you uh, who are here with us right now you can take a few more few more minutes maybe another 10 minutes if you'd like to share any reflections insights uh, from your act from the activity or just through the session if you'd like to share anything that came up for you we can just hear everybody and then we can close Hi. So the one word that I would take back from the session was seeing uh, because uh, while you were, I just got one thought like previously, why have I not thought about all these things in depth myself? So as you said, I was just, I just realized that I was just consuming the second hand knowledge that someone else have observed something and I was just taking it in as a knowledge. And even though I thought that I was practicing, but it is just the second hand knowledge that I was practicing. So it's not the real unlearning or the learning that is happening. And uh, another thing that occurred to me was unlearning and learning is actually going simultaneously. So it's not the two different things that's happening. Uh, because people used to tell me so many times that you just need to stop learning and you need to spend some time to unlearn as well and relearn as well. Yeah. So I always, that those jargons have always con you know, confused me. So right now in the session, what I was, uh, you know, while you were, you know, talking and discussing so many things, multiple, even though it was some connectivity here and there, but I just realized, okay, I'm actually unlearning and similarly I'm learning something else, something new, or maybe through your point of view. So it's just going inside me. So that was the realization <clears throat> that happened to me and it was very beautiful. And uh, <clears throat> I learned, I think, I learned about myself more, more than the you know, information that you shared or the you know, uh, statements that you shared on the slides. So thank you so much for the session. Thank you. Anybody else? We can maybe quickly hear, I think seven, in a few minutes, the next session is starting, so. Thank you, Rosaria. Um, I think this is a beginning of uh, a journey for me as well. And uh, it's been wonderful to like just journey with all of you. I know the timings, they were, we, we did have a bit of a push and pull with the organizing group as well. I, did, I had not, no idea about the scheduled plan. So uh, I'm hoping that the time here with me was worthwhile and I'm very grateful to be able to unlearn, uh, begin at least explore this unlearning journey with all of you. Please stay in touch if you Google up Unlearning Ashram. Uh, you can always connect with us and join us, add your wisdom and insights in our journey. And let's create a beautiful world for us and each other. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time and your presence.